Well, the rain has abated a bit, so we can get started. Good evening. Tonight is the fifth and final seminar of the 2022 season of seminars at Steamboat. It's also the 88th in our 20-year history. Yes. I'm Walt Abbott, Seminars Chair, and it's my pleasure to extend greetings from the Seminars Board to all of you who are here in person this evening and to those of you who will be watching later on a YouTube video. We are excited to have you with us as our speaker shares his insights into the leanings and rulings of the highest court of the land. For two decades, Seminars has presented a plethora of insightful and forward-looking public policy presentations by distinguished experts. And we have tried to continue that tradition with this summer's spectrum of pressing issues. Our political divide, China, cryptocurrencies, attainable housing, and this evening's presentation on the US Supreme Court. Many people have helped to make this season a success. Above all, it's you, our audience, and our donors who've kept the seminars vibrant and engaged, and engaged uh, on, on a, a wide spectrum of current events. Thank you for your support, and please continue your generosity. In the coming days, you will be getting a survey via email where we will ask you to provide your feedback on the 2022 season. We hope you will complete the survey and give us that feedback. Later this week, the seminar's board will meet and begin making plans for next year's program. And over the course of the winter, I'll be sending an occasional email updating you on the topics and the speakers for the 2023 season once we have been able to finalize arrangements. Please join me in giving special thanks to this evening's program sponsor, Jan and Bill Dring. And many thanks as well to tonight's supporting sponsors, Susan and Alan Kirkpatrick, and David Lamb with Dave, Edward Jones. You can view any seminars program by going to our website and clicking on past seminars. Those videos will be available about a week after the live presentation and will include closed captioning. KUNC, Community Radio of Northern Colorado, is again making audio talks available on their seminars podcast landing page at KUNC.org. Once our speaker has concluded his presentation, he will take your questions, which you can submit at any time by scanning the QR code on the back of your program or by opening your phone's browser and entering www.joinqa.com and the entry code is 85518. Our speaker this evening is Garrett Epps, and here to introduce him and to moderate the Q&A session is seminar's past chair, Bob Stein. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and welcome, as Walt said, to the fifth and final seminar of this really highly timely and successful seminar series. It's appropriate that we end with a topic, the Supreme Court 2022 Institutional Shock and Constitutional Change, where the end of the court's term included decisions that have created far more than just institutional shocks. 
while the President and Congress have received low polling numbers, we could look to the courts, especially the Supreme Court, as an institution that commanded respect from the American people. That was then, this is now. The court and the president are at about the same low level. Our speaker today, Garrett Epps, has taught about the Supreme Court from coast to coast, especially uh, at the University of Oregon, then the University of Baltimore, and now back to Oregon, where he is a professor of practice. He is also a journalist. He has been president of the Harvard Crimson and has written extensively about the court, including stints as a Supreme Court reporter at The Atlantic and currently at the Washington Monthly. When he moved back to Oregon, the University of Baltimore's Law School magazine called him this generation's H.L. Mencken. His writing includes several novels and nonfiction works about the law, the Constitution, and the Supreme Court, including this book, American Epic, Reading the U.S. Constitution. In the preface to this book, and yes, I've read beyond the preface, he quotes former Justice Robert Jackson as stating about the court, quote, we are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible because we are final. Is it still? Please join me in giving a big steamboat welcome to Garrett Epps. Thanks, uh, Bob, for that generous introduction. I want to thank the seminars at Steamboat for the chance to come here and uh, talk to you tonight about the subject that has uh, obsessed me, for better or worse, uh, for 30 years. Uh, I have to start with a, a confession. Uh, I am uh, a law professor. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, you'd be forgiven if thinking that what law professors usually do is show up and say, we have a list of cases to go through tonight, and the first case is, at which point about half the audience will usually lose consciousness. Um, I think the most boring presentation I've ever seen in my life was by Chief Justice Rehnquist, his famous speech on Chief Justices of the United States. And he clicked through each item until several members of the platform party literally keeled over. Uh, <laughs> so I thought I would take your invitation as a chance to ask a bigger question than uh, this or that case. And that is a question I think is on a lot of uh, our minds. And that is, you know, what the heck is going on at the Supreme Court? What is, where are we? Uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, what is to come? Because I don't think that's really entirely uh, something we can know about. So looking at the whole picture of what has happened to the court in the last uh, five years or six years, um, is that, that's not what law professors usually do. Uh, is it law at all? Maybe it's political science. I finally concluded that it is really uh, theology. Um, and that is, arising from the old lawyer saying, I know many of you know it, that God has terrible delusions of grandeur because on occasion he thinks he's a federal judge. Uh, so please accept what follows as, as theological speculation. Um, and I am going to go through my, my thesis of what is going on. Uh, and I know people will have questions about some of the specific cases that have been decided recently, um, and I would prefer to tackle those in questions because uh, I've got a lot to say about what I think is going on. It's a huge story. It's a story with many moving parts. Um, and uh, my thesis uh, is that regardless of whether you approve or disapprove of what the court has done in the past year or two years, 
I think it's hard to deny, once the question is posed, that this court has become a completely different institution than it was in February 2016 when the late Justice Scalia died uh, unexpectedly. And I don't mean that there's been a change in degree, that the court is more conservative or uh, you know, that it is, it is uh, more apt to be interested in this or that area. I mean a difference in kind. We are looking at a, an institutional metamorphosis, uh, which is not complete, but is very portentous. And I'm going to try to take us through that process without a lot of extraneous value judgments on my part. Um, I think it will be clear as we go along that I have some strong opinions uh, about what the court has done, but I'm going to try to soft pedal those because I think that regardless of what, where you are on given issues, uh, what is going on in the court is significant and it is very hard, I think, to deny. Um, now, what do I mean by a different institution? Why, why, would you, why would I say that? Well, let's run briefly through some of the aspects of the court's operations and its institutional life and see how much has changed since Justice Scalia died. Um, and the first and most obvious thing, I think, is that we have different personnel on the court. Four of the nine justices who will uh, enter the court chamber uh, on the first Monday in October uh, will have been on the court for five years or less. I cannot find a parallel to that before 1942, when uh, President Roosevelt in his third term got to replace eventually eight of the justices, and we had a very rapid change in the function of the court in constitutional law. So we, you know, for me to say, yes, I spent 10 years in the court um, press gallery, but I was watching different people. Uh, and to say, what effect is Justice uh, uh, Barrett going to have, or what effect is Justice Jackson going to have? Uh, you tell me. Just, uh, the late Justice John Paul Stevens, of blessed memory, wrote a book once in which he said that instead of talking about these courts in terms of the Chief Justice, the Warren Court, the Burger Court, he said every court, every time a new justice is named to the court, you have an entirely different court. The, the dynamics within the court change, and obviously uh, with four, that's a pretty uh, extreme change. So personnel. Secondly, we have a, clearly a different approach by the majority on this court to questions of jurisprudence, how constitutional law is done, and the meaning of precedent and the extent to which it binds uh, courts under the rule of law. And I think you, we saw an absolute blockbuster. I've never seen a blockbuster like this. I never covered one even close to being as explosive as June of this year, where we saw major opinions, precedent-busting, consequential opinions in the area of abortion rights, gun rights, church and state, environmental regulation, and federal Indian law. Uh, each of these very ambitious, and very eager to sweep aside precedents uh, of earlier courts that the majority regarded as not worth, worthy of respect. Um, the court exercises its power in a very different way through extensive use of what is called, and I, I, most people by now have heard this term, of the emergency docket or what is called the shadow docket. Um, I, statistics that I reviewed in preparation for this talk suggested that the court now issues twice as many emergency orders, uh, so-called emergency orders, as it did five years ago. And what the shadow docket does is allow a majority of the justices to reach down into the lower courts while cases are pending there and take those cases away from the lower courts and decide them on a preliminary basis, and then send them back to the lower court with a strong hint of how the court, uh, how the case should come out. Um, this is 
almost completely closed to the public. It is kind of like the workings of the Vatican. Um, <laughs> the court's merits docket, as I think we know, uh, puts a, puts a, accepts certiorari in a court in a case, sets out the questions presented, sets a date for briefs, a date for oral arguments. Uh, the court is open to amicus briefs from any group that is concerned about the result. Oral argument is heard on the record. The court then eventually issues a lengthy opinion explaining its reasoning, and we know how the justices voted. Virtually none of that happens in the shadow docket. So when a case like the Biden administration's uh, 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 eviction moratorium or health care restrictions in California during the middle of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic come along, the court decides these based on the sketchiest of applications, sometimes four, five, ten pages long, without oral argument, often without written opinion. And we don't always know who voted how. Uh, they accept no particular obligation to explain what they're doing. Uh, and this is, this is a real change, and it's one, I think, that has come to stay. Procedures are very different of the court itself as it operates, uh, you know, as a court. Um, the last time there was uh, oral argument, in-person public oral argument, which was March of 2020, uh, oral argument took place in front of a courtroom full of people, lawyers and the general public who were willing to stand in line to hear the argument. Oral argument was a very tightly uh, choreographed uh, process, almost to the second. Uh, the advocates were uh, limited in how long they could talk. Um, and uh, Justice Thomas had spoken twice in 11 years. Um, I was there for both. <laughs> they turned out to be cases that were not terribly interesting to my colleagues in the press corps, and so I acquired a little unmerited status. <laughs> yes, I was there. I know what his voice sounds like. <laughs> Today, of course, oral argument takes place in a largely empty courtroom. The advocates are present. The justices are present. Um, the, the press corps is allowed in, masked and spaced. Uh, it is, uh, the time limits are much looser. Uh, it's not uncommon now for a one hour oral argument to occupy two full hours because the Chief Justice, like a uh, uh, soccer ref referee, will sort of award, you know, you can have more time and you can have more time. Um, it, it, we may be going back to the days when uh, in the 19th century, when the advocates just showed up and argued until they ran out of things to say, um, it's my understanding that uh, argument in the Dartmouth College case took seven full days, and that must have been fairly tiring. Um, Justice Thomas is now perhaps the most active questioner, and certainly usually asked the first question. Um, at the same time, the relationship of oral argument to the public has changed in a very complicated way. No one is allowed in. No one can see it. But in the days of public oral argument, the court was absolutely adamant that there would be no real-time transmission of what went on in the courtroom. Obviously, no video, but also no audio. Audio was recorded, but it was carefully kept from the public until the Friday after oral argument, by which point, of course, very few people wanted to, to listen to it. Now, the public is excluded from the courtroom, but the audio of the arguments is available in real time on YouTube. And whether this is an improvement or not, I don't know. It certainly makes my life easier. Um, and then finally, the court has a very different face to the public. Uh, one of the more vivid things that I got to do as a Supreme Court reporter was to stand on the plaza in front of the court uh, and look at uh, happy or angry demonstrations, uh, the place that we, the people, sort of claimed our ownership of the court 
uh, our right to react to what the court had done. I will never forget watching Jim Obergefell uh, after the decision uh, saying that the Constitution protected same-sex marriage, standing in front of an ecstatic crowd and taking a phone call on his cell phone from Barack Obama, congratulating him on his victory. It's my understanding that uh, Joe Biden also called, but that call went to voicemail. Um, <laughs> it, that plaza is now walled off. And if you want a metaphor for the court in 2022, take a look at a picture of that plaza, which is now surrounded by what they call an unscalable fence. And the court is now surrounded by an unscalable fence in more ways than one. Now, how did this happen? Well, I think the past five years have been a process that has destabilized the American idea of judicial independence, right? We're all taught in school judicial independence is something we're very proud of. Uh, there's huge disagreement about what it means. There's a vast political science literature, which I will spare you. What we know is that the Constitution provides certain structural protections for the uh, uh, independence of the courts generally and of the Supreme Court. Uh, it is protected against the states in two ways. Article three uh, requires the uh, creation of one Supreme Court. We can't go back to the system of the Articles of Confederation where each state had its own Supreme Court and there was no central authority on federal law. And Article Six, Section Two, the Supremacy Clause, says that federal law is supreme and that it is binding on state courts. So state courts are not free to ignore the Supreme Court as they tried to do early in the life of the republic. Um, there are also structural protections against the federal branches. Uh, the justices famously have tenure for good behavior, which in, in practice means until they choose to retire or die. Um, we have never, we, impeachment is the only remedy for judicial misconduct. Only one justice in history has ever been impeached. No justice has ever been removed and convicted by two thirds of the Senate. So those are pretty robust protections against the states and the other branches. But we're kind of facing a question that is a kind of in run around that. And that is, what if the other branches get tired of judicial independence? What if the court itself or a majority of its members decide that it's no fun to be separated from the other branches? What if a majority of the court decides they like some states and don't like others? Uh, what happens when the court develops, and, and those of you who have been subjected to law school have undoubtedly read Hamilton's famous uh, Federalist number 78, he says the court has neither force nor will, but only judgment. What if the court develops will? What if the court has its program for the United States and expects the rest of us to follow? I think the new meaning of judicial independence is the unscalable uh, fence. Uh, this court considers itself at the moment independent of and above the public it nominally serves. It doesn't concern itself with public opinion and it is very explicit that it is not going to consider, concern itself with the consequences of its cases for ordinary Americans. The cases now turn on abstract propositions. Uh, what the consequences of this will be, we don't know because I said destabilized. I don't think the court has come to rest. I think we are in a process of rapid change. It could go in any number of directions. But we can look back and see how this happened. Uh, because since Justice Scalia died, we have seen very remarkable, intense, and unremitting assault on the very idea 
of an independent judiciary, by which I mean a judiciary independent of partisan politics. Now, the assault has come from both sides. I, I know someone is going to uh, want to make that point, and it's absolutely true. But it would be a mistake to say that both sides have done this and leave it at that, because the vanguard of this assault has come from one side. It has come from the Republican Party, the conservative legal movement, what we call the religious right, and most prominently from former President Trump. The Democratic Party and some progressive groups have responded. Uh, some things that they have done have also contributed to destabilization in ways that are disturbing. Uh, but it tends to be reactive. Nonetheless, the combination has meant that judicial independence is no longer a stable concept. And that the public is very split about it. Many don't want it. Others may want it, but don't believe it exists anymore. And this has created, uh, at least potentially, a crisis of credibility for the court. The idea of an independent, nonpartisan judiciary is now largely obsolete. Well, how did this happen? As I said, there are a lot of moving parts. Forgive me for doing this. I'm not getting stock prices. I'm just trying to keep track of how long I talk because I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, obviously, each of the appointments that have been uh, approved since 2016 uh, has been a powerfully shaped uh, bipartisan politics, beginning with the blockade of Merrick Garland and ending with the appointment of Justice Jackson. Um, beyond that, uh, the specific Supreme Court appointments, the names of justices, have played a role in electoral politics that I cannot find any historical parallel for in the 2016, 2018, and 2020 uh, political campaigns. Going back to 2016, Donald Trump in May was facing a real challenge to his credibility as a potential Republican presidential nominee. The con simply put, the conservative wing of the party, the conservative legal movement, and the religious right did not trust him. He was a former Democrat. He had formerly been or described himself as pro-choice. Uh, he had sp uh, speculated that maybe he would name his sister, Judge, uh, Judge Barry, to the court. She would make a great Supreme Court justice. Uh, people thought he was a little flaky. I you know, can't imagine why. Uh, in May 2016, he released a list of potential Supreme Court nominees. Uh, and he it committed to naming a justice from that list. He said, I will pick my justice from this list. And people who are much more inside politics than I believe that that list uh, clinched the nomination for him that the resistance to him uh, in the conservative wing of the party collapsed on the grounds that we're going to get what we want. He has, he has promised us that. In September, of course, uh, when the election was not going terribly well for him, he released another list. He reminded people. And the result of this was that for the first time in American history, the specific names of potential justices were, in essence, on the ballot. And we can talk about you know, the, the adverse consequences of this, which are, I think are manifold. It is now going to be part of the political process going forward. Um, beyond that, of course, having named his potential nominees, uh, in October, in the debate October 19th with Hillary Clinton, he said that his justices would automatically overturn Roe versus Wade, that that would happen if he became president. So that again, we have, for the first time, a specific result promised and on the ballot. And what conservatives learned from that, in fact, I think what everyone uh, in the political system learned from that, is that the Supreme Court is a winning electoral issue, which had never been clear before. That was no unique event. Two years later, in 2018, the Senate was completing the, the debacle that was the uh, Kavanaugh confirmation. 
Uh, and I think we all, you know, whatever you thought of the nomination, you can agree that the process was a debacle. Um, and the Trump campaign weaponized that nomination as a culture war issue. In other words, Trump went around to his rallies, and he didn't do what presidents usually do, and which is perfectly inoffensive, which is to say, I nominated Brett Kavanaugh. Wasn't he a great nomination? Everybody claps. Uh, instead, he said that Kavanaugh was a, a counterattack to the reign of feminists and me too's and the threat that is being posed to American men. And he said over and over, uh, he would start and he would discuss Professor Ford and call her a liar and then say, we have to protect our men from these uh, illicit um, uh, accusations, and then this is a quote, think of your husbands, think of your sons, right? That they were men as victims, uh, we had to push back against them. Um, and uh, the other thing to be aware of during this period is that dark money came to play a huge role in, in uh, uh, Supreme Court nominations more than ever before. Uh, the estimate I've seen is that between the Gorsuch nomination and the uh, Kavanaugh nomination, we haven't even gotten to Barrett, um, $37 million was expended in dark money uh, by groups whose donors we don't know for uh, propaganda of various kinds in support of these nominations. Ruth Marcus, uh, the editorial editor of the Washington Post, wrote a really terrific book called Supreme Ambition which is a kind of TikTok of the uh, uh, Kavanaugh nomination. And she recounts that when Susan Collins eventually ended the suspense, came to the Senate, and voted for Kavanaugh, saying he had promised not to overturn Roe versus Wade. <laughs> I'll leave that one there. But uh, uh, that Senator Lindsey Graham, the first person to speak to her after she cast her vote, came up to her and said, Congratulations, we're going to make Shelley Adelson your campaign manager. Now, for those of you who don't follow these things, Sheldon Adelson, the uh, Las Vegas casino billionaire, is the largest single donor to conservative and Republican causes. The money flooded in to support Senator Collins. She was considered uh, to be endangered, and of course, she was handily reelected. Uh, so you can see that the 2018 congressional elections were saturated with the issue of the Supreme Court. Once again, a winning issue uh, for the conservative side. Going forward to 2020, uh, Judge Justice Barrett was confirmed while presidential voting was going on. We had been told that this was wrong, but it turned out that, that it was right. Um, <laughs> Republicans at their rallies were chanting, fill that seat, fill that seat which I suppose is marginally better than lock her up or <laughs> build that wall. Uh, but nonetheless, really not the way Supreme Court nominations had been considered politically. Um, and in that campaign, a couple of interesting things happened. The first is that the, Repu the Republicans began demanding, as a, as a matter of right, that uh, uh, former Vice President Biden turn over a list of whom he would appoint, as if this were now a normal part of presidential politics. And Biden didn't do that, but he did do something else, which was not completely unprecedented, but still fairly startling. And that was his promise in May of 2020 that he would name a black woman to the court. Uh, again, insiders, people who really follow these things, believe that that promise on the eve of the South Carolina primary saved his candidacy and eventually procured his election. So the Democrats have learned that the Supreme Court is a winning issue now too, and they certainly are counting on it uh, in the midterm elections. Um, so thoroughly politicized nomination confirmation process in a way that, that was uh, uh, unprecedented before. At the same time, we had Donald Trump's constant attacks on the very idea of independent courts uh, and the rule of law. Uh, the attacks on the courts began in January of 2016 when Trump attacked uh, his rival, Senator Ted Cruz, 
uh, for his liberalism in, in supporting uh, that radical left-wing socialist, John G. Roberts, uh, for chief justice. He said Roberts was terrible. He voted for, for Affordable Care Act, uh, Act. My justices won't, won't do that. I guarantee my justices are going to toe the line. Um, uh, in 2020, he demanded that Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor recused because he objected to things they had said. Um, and he attacked, before and during his term, specific lower court judges. Now, you know, Supreme Court justices can take care of themselves. They have security. Uh, they have a great life. Boy, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, don't get me started. But, uh, but lower court judges, you know, We've, we've lost several lower court judges in the last few years to assassinations and so forth, and they live with, with danger. And these attacks by President Trump required some of these judges to go to undisclosed locations for long periods of time. Starting in the spring of 2016, Judge Gonzalo Curiel of the District of California was a Mexican judge and therefore unfit uh, to judge a case involving Donald Trump. Uh, when Judge Robart of the Western District of Washington enjoined the first Muslim ban or travel ban, he called him a so-called judge. Um, judge Derek Watson of the District of Hawaii, who enjoined the second travel ban, he called him a political judge who had committed political overreach. Um, finally, Judge Tiger, the, not finally, but Judge Tiger in the Western District of California, uh, who enjoined a Trump uh, uh, immigration policy, he said, was an Obama judge. This isn't law. This is an Obama judge. Um, moving forward, a whole step worse was the attack on Judge Amy Berman Jackson of the District of Columbia, who had presided over a trial, a jury trial, in which Trump's friend Roger Stone was convicted of witness tampering in regard to the Mueller probe. And as the sentence was pending, Trump began to tweet what were, I think, fairly could only be construed as threats against Judge Jackson, particularly coupled with uh, a post that Stone himself put up of a picture of Judge Jackson with crosshairs uh, next to it. Um, trying to interfere with federal sentencing is a felony. Uh, the problem, of course, with Trump is so many things were going on that things just passed by without much remark, but this was really shocking. Um, and of course, these attacks were heard inside the court, and they produced a response from inside the court. Uh, as early as 2016, Justice Ginsburg uh, said she didn't want to think about what America and the court would be like if Trump won. Remarkably indiscreet thing, for any sitting justice to say, when this is what I meant by the idea that we're destabilizing the idea of judicial independence. And Justice Ginsburg really was usually so discreet in the things she said. It was just remarkable that she had apparently felt provoked to that extent. And then finally, in, in 2019, uh, after the attack on Judge Tiger and the idea that he was an Obama judge, the Chief Justice of the United States did something no Chief Justice has ever done before, and that is to rebuke the President publicly and say, we do not have Obama judges. We have an independent judiciary. Now, that was remarkable enough. I read it and, you know, I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because John Roberts is not someone who uh, courts the limelight. But what was even more remarkable was the President fired back by name, in two tweets, attacking the courts, and he put the idea of independent judiciary in scare quotes. He made clear that he had no regard for that. Uh, just as a final aside on the rule of law, note that in 2017, he'd been less president for less than a year, the president reached down and pardoned uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, of uh, Maricopa County, Arizona, whose case was not, had not fully gone through the appellate courts. And Arpaio's offense was not ordinary law, uh, law breaking. It was deliberate defiance of a federal court order. So flagrant 
that the court was able to convict him in a trial of criminal contempt of court. And by reaching down and voiding that conviction, Trump sent a very powerful message about what he thought uh, about the rule of law and about courts as a constraint uh, on executive power. Um, and then finally, you come to an episode that is not really as widely discussed as I think it ought to be. You know, of all the things that kept me awake during the Trump administration, this was in some ways the most severe, and that is that the Trump administration apparently came within days of simply setting aside a Supreme Court order that was adverse to its position. Not since 1861 had that happened, when President Lincoln defied a writ of habeas corpus issued by Chief Justice Taney. The census case was one that was very high on the political agenda of the administration because um, what they wanted to do was add a question to the long form, the census long form questionnaire, which every citizen is theoretically obligated to fill out, every household head, uh, that would say, is every member of this household an American citizen? Now that question hadn't been asked on the long form for more than 70 years because census experts said it would discourage households that included immigrants from answering and would produce a significantly less uh, accurate census. It would, however, everyone agreed, provide political advantage for one side um, because cities, areas with a lot of immigrant populations would lose representation if the final count showed their population to be less than it actually was. And the administration was uh, determined to wedge this onto the census despite the objection of the professionals. And they did it by lying. And they lied in a way that really wasn't intended to fool anybody. Uh, just kind of straight-faced, you know, double wink. Oh yes, we need that question to enforce the Voting Rights Act. You know, the Voting Rights Act. Um, the case got to the Supreme Court and the court five to four, four justices were willing to accept this rationale. But the Chief Justice voted with the court's liberals uh, to say, and it was an interesting rebuke, because the Chief Justice's opinion said, well, constitutionally, of course, you, the government can put that question. It's not violate the census clause. And in statutory terms, actually, as I read the Census Act, uh, they could put that on there. It's perfectly valid. You know, it might be a good decision. It might not. But they can't put this question on this census because they lied to us. Because the government's answers were false. And that's a pretty explosive charge. Now, what's interesting is that almost immediately, I mean, as if primed, Right-wing commentators, the Wall Street Journal, uh, right-wing radio began to say, actually, the president has the, alter the prerogative to ignore that. The census is an executive function, and the president can do whatever he wants. The courts doesn't really have jurisdiction over this case. Ten days after the decision, Trump announced that he was considering setting aside the decision and proceeding with the question. His attorney general, William Barr, said that he thought that would be perfectly legal. I really felt we were heading for uh, a very serious interbranch conflict uh, with an unpredictable result. In the end, Trump backed off, I think in part just because he was convinced the logistics wouldn't work. It was too late in the process. Uh, but that was a kind of remarkable thing, especially when you consider this was basically his Supreme Court. Right, this was the one time that that majority stood up and said, no, we're not gonna go along with you. And Donald Trump, of course, is the person who believed, who won the 2016 election and still insists that it was rigged, right? Uh, he, he, he doesn't believe in winning. Uh, and if you cross him, you're an enemy. Um, so that's where we stand, right? In the, at the end of the election, the court clearly began to experience a little bit of concern 
that the public perceived it as partisan. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not going to belabor the irony, but I will say that all three of Trump's appointees made it their business to go to Kentucky and appear in public, in person, with Mitch McConnell, who is the senator from Kentucky and who, of course, has to be reelected from time to time. McConnell delivered remarks in which he would assess each justice's uh, jurisprudence and say he approved of it and that they were good judges. Um, and then they would, the justices would hold forth about the legitimacy of the court. Um, Justice Barrett, standing next to Mitch McConnell at the Mitch McConnell Public Policy Center, began her remarks as follows. My goal today is to convince you that this court is not comprised of a bunch of partisan hacks. I think I'm just going to leave that one there. <laughs> a week after that, Justice Alito delivered a speech saying that the court needed legitimacy from the public and that the way to get it was for the people criticizing the court to shut up. <laughs> that it was the fault of the media. Uh, Justice Breyer joined in with a lecture at Harvard where he said the media should not characterize justices as conservative or liberal. They should not characterize opinions as conservative or liberal because otherwise the public will lose faith in the court. Justice Thomas made similar remarks. Not one of these justices said Maybe legitimacy is something we have to earn. The idea was, this is our due. The public owes it to us. And those who criticize us, you know, are wrong. Justice Alito, in fact, criticized one reporter by name who then experienced threats and, and some real danger to his person. Um, so that's what's come from the conservative side. Now, as I promised, uh, I am going to note that it's not all one-sided. Uh, beginning in about October of 2018, beginning after the Kavanaugh nomination, we began to hear from progressives and uh, Democrats in a very serious way that the court needed reform. Uh, Professor Michael Klarman, one of the premier constitutional law and historian at Harvard uh, Law School in 2018, said we need to after this, we need to reconfigure the court. We need to pack it. Uh, two scholars, young scholars, published an uh, article eventually in the Yale Law Journal with a very complicated uh, but not sort of bald-faced scheme for restoring partisan balance uh, to the bench. And that proposal was picked up in March by then presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg. It became the Buttigieg plan. And since then, proposals for, uh, for Supreme Court reform have been a part of Democrat discu democratic discourse uh, uh, right along. Um, so, uh, as I said, Justice, uh, President, uh, then former Vice President Biden, was uh, asked repeatedly for a list of his nominees, and the Republicans said, if you vote for Biden, he'll pack the court with Democrats. Uh, again, I'm sort of tempted to leave that one there without a lot of comment. Uh, but what's interesting is that pressure from inside the Democratic Party became so intense uh, that Biden felt obliged in October to promise that he would appoint a commission to study the issue. Uh, I actually knew some of the commissioners. One of them told me, more or less in confidence, that he said the, the function of this commission was to get Joe Biden out of the question in that final debate. And we achieved that uh, simply by coming into existence. And the commission met for six months and then solemnly announced that no reform was needed. Um, so uh, that's where we are, right? Um, and where we go from here, I don't know. But on the evidence of June and the blockbuster decisions, uh, we face a court majority, not a six justice majority, but a five justice majority, that is really determined to impose its own vision uh, on 
not only the government, but on society as a whole, that conceives itself in a central role. This has been something conservatives have been talking about uh, for many, many years. In 2002, former Watergate independent prosecutor Ken Starr published a book in which he said that in our system, the Supreme Court is first among equals. The Supreme Court sets policy, and the executive and Congress carry it out. Um, that, I think that is the, the, the vision that is held by some people in, uh, on First Street Northeast uh, in Washington. Whether that will happen is a different question. Uh, despite what I said at the outset, um, Supreme Court justices are not gods. And God laughs at their plans just the way he laughs at ours. Constitution shows that. We don't know what's going to happen. What we do know is that public opinion will play a role in what happens uh, in front of the court. We know the other branches will play a role in what happens to the court. Uh, we know that this court may be forced to change, uh, to change direction. This court may be subject to reform proposals uh, that alter its nature. This court has not come to a stable place in terms of its uh, position in our government now, its function in our government today, which is quite different than it was six years ago. Um, the fact of the matter is nobody can control what happens next. The court is rolling around the decks. The court seems to be up for grabs. Um, and this kind of institutional transformation, sudden, unpredictable, uh, and, and sort of independent of other constraints, is a little bit like a Western wildfire, which I know everybody here is familiar with. Some of them occur naturally. Some of them are set. But either way, no one, no human being, no group, no majority, no government can control what happens next. How widely, how long, how hot, and how fatally they burn. And that's where we are today. So on that note, I think I will uh, open it up for your questions, and I appreciate your attention. Well, I don't want to waste any time. All right. So let me, while you are getting this out, first thank you, and then start with a question which has come from a number of people, but I'll put it in a slightly different context. Um, you had talked about uh, the idea that some people might want to pack the court. There have been a number of suggestions, including age limits, because people are living a lot longer than they used to, uh, even though you, uh, the court serves for good behavior and a life tenure, um, there are people who have wanted to change the number on the court. Uh, and in your book, you may not all know this, but the court was as low as five people yeah. at one time mm -hmm. and as many as 10. So the number nine is not necessarily sacrosanct. Where do you think it should go? Uh, you know, this is a very difficult question. Um, it is certainly true that we need to be aware that in history, the number uh, of the justices has been changed and often for uh, explicitly political reasons. Um, uh, the, the number of justices on the court was reduced by the outgoing Federalist Congress in 1800 because they didn't want Jefferson uh, to have an appointee, and he, he in fact did, did, not, did not get one. Uh, the same thing happened to Andrew Johnson, um, and I think we can, we can all be glad that President Johnson didn't get his, his nomination, but the, the size of the court was reduced. So it really is more or less a, a happenstance. I, I tend to think that it ought to be an odd number, but uh, that's as far as we can go. Now, you know, what President Roosevelt did in 37 was to try to do the straightforward thing of adding justices to the court. 
I think that if he had done that, if he had just said, we need more justices on the court because, you know, we're in a crisis, I think he would have won. I think that the court would have been altered. Uh, Roosevelt got a little trickier than he needed to be and claimed he was doing this because the justices were old and infirm and needed help. Uh, and it's like we want to enforce the Voting Rights Act. Nobody believed that. Um, it is remarkable how close he came to succeeding even so, right? And the world we live in might be very different. I'm not sure jurisprudence would be any different because he got eight appointments in the next five years. And so if he'd gotten six appointments in 1937, the result would have been roughly the same. But we wouldn't live with this idea that the number of justices is something that the framers came up with. Uh, at the same time, you know, well, here, here is the thing. Somebody said to me, well, if the Democrats do that, right, they increase the number to 12, then the Republicans will come in and they'll increase the number to 15. And then the Democrats will come back and they'll increase the number to 18, to which my answer was, awesome, <laughs> right? Because each time you increase the number of justices, you make each individual appointment less important. So that eventually we have a court that's just functioning like a court. You know, uh, 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 Colorado is in the 10th Circuit, and the 10th Circuit Court. You, you don't, I, I doubt many of you sit up late at night wondering about, you know, worrying about the identity of the latest appointee to the 10th Circuit, because it's a multi-member court. They, they sit in panels, uh, subject to end bank review. Uh, the Supreme Court would be much more of a court uh, than it is now. Um, I think there's a proposal that's been kicking around for a long time. My former dean, Paul Carrington, uh, from Duke University originated it, which basically said there should be an appointment every two years and the, and the nine junior justices should be the active justices. After 18 years, a justice would not be removed because you know this is not a constitutional amendment. They're not gonna remove life tenure, but they would become a senior judge. We have senior judges on the lower courts. They're still Article III judges with all the protections that Article III judges have, but they would only sit on cases if one of the nine junior justices was uh, conflicted out, you know, had to recuse for whatever reason. I think that's, that's a very good plan. Again, because it would make it less, it would make it less likely that you'd have someone plan for partisan capture of the court. Every president's gonna get two appointments uh, the court will be constantly changing. Each individual appointment uh, would be less impor uh, important. But, you know, the idea of how much hung on whether Mitch McConnell could jam Amy Barrett through, uh, through the Congress before the election, it, it's wrong. It's not the way uh, a democratic system should be run. It's not the way a court system should be run. So, you know, what I've done is take your question and rephrase it and you said, what's your solution? And I said, yep, sure is a problem. Well, see how you rephrase, <laughs> rephrase the next one. One yeah. of the things you said is there should be an odd number. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that leads to yeah. is a discussion of the question of recusal. A judge or a justice saying, I'm taking myself out of this particular case because of a conflict or something else. So the question has come up. Um, lower courts do have standards of conflict. Yeah. The limited number of people on the Supreme Court has uh, contributed to there not being a way to have recusal. Should there be? How, what should it be? Uh, think of what are some of the kinds of conflicts that uh, people have talked about. Uh, should what your spouse does be considered part of the equation? Um, this is, um, here I am taking some of your questions. Um, well, I think that uh, the way to, uh, I, I think that the standard recusal rules for lower court judges would be just perfectly charming at the Supreme Court and could be, it could be attained by statute, right? The question would become, you know, how do you enforce them? But you have that same problem with lower court judges, right? Because they are life tenured as well. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, I, 
for various reasons, I grew up and I knew quite a, quite a number of federal judges as a, as a young man. Uh, covered some of them, you know, others were friends of the family and so forth. Uh, when I got out of law school, I clerked on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And, you know, by and large, the judges I've known and the ones I've respected were very careful about observing recusal rules. Now, there's been a study, I think it was Reuters, that produced a study that showed that there have been like 300 cases in the last 10 years where lower court judges have sat, right, uh, on places where they might reasonably be considered to have an old-fashioned conflict of interest like money. And that, that, that is shocking and it shouldn't happen. Um, I certainly think that is entirely appropriate to recuse yourself from a case that could involve significant embarrassment for your spouse. I, I just think that that, you know, that justice might be privy to things that are not in the record. And when that justice is the only one who votes that the presidential records need not be disclosed, you know, part of the whole standard of judicial ethics is that it's not enough that justice should be done, it must be seen to be done. It is not enough to be impartial, we must avoid the appearance of partiality. And to be honest, I think that the whole issue of, of Mrs. Thomas and her participation and her use of the justice's own email list service to, to uh, uh, involve people in this electoral scheme, I think it's very disturbing. I think, as I said, we've had destabilization of the idea of judicial independence. Justice Thomas's view of it is clearly quite different uh, from the one that you or I might have. And I would like to see more norms set up. I mean, the real problem with this court is that they don't care about the norms anymore. They don't care about precedent. They don't care about nonpartisanship. Um, they don't care about uh, ethics uh, of the sort we're just describing now. I, I don't, now, I'm not trying to tar all the judges uh, with that brush, but I do think questions have been raised that are very disturbing. I went to Greenhouse just yesterday, uh, for those who read the print edition of papers as opposed to online, commented about um, the Dobbs decision, the uh, reversal of Roe against Wade, being grounded on reasons of religion, uh, not constitutional law. And what, is, what do you think of what she said or of what Justice Alito said? Well, I think this is a very important point, and it's going to cause some very real uh, anguish and, and political upheaval, because I think part of the project of a significant number of these justices, it could be summarized by, by the term Christian nationalism. That is to say, these are people who believe that the role of government is to enforce what they conceive of as the American values of Christianity and that Christ, organized Christianity should have a significant role in forming public policy. Uh, you can infer that from Justice Alito's remarks uh, at the uh, Notre Dame, there's two speeches, one at Notre Dame University and his second one at an international conference in Rome that was sponsored by Notre Dame. Uh, but if you really want uh, uh, a, a very thumping statement of that, Go back and look at oral argument in a case called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, which is from the previous term, not from this term, and for Justice Alito's separate opinion in that case. And the issue in that case was whether a Catholic social service agency that operated under contract from the City of Philadelphia to engage in foster child placements, whether it could adopt a rule that because of the religious beliefs uh, of the church, it would not place foster children with same-sex couples. Could they adopt that? And you know, the court said nine to nothing that they could. Um, I, I'm gonna leave that there, but Justice Alito wrote a separate opinion and, and his comments at oral argument echoed the same thing, basically saying, you know, uh, the background of it, he didn't say it in these words, but you know, we're living in a kind of socialist dystopia. And it used to be that Christian churches handled these things. 
adoption, family. These were church matters. And the secular state has taken them over and is now imposing these godless values uh, on us. And that is very much um, the, the central ideological tenet uh, of a specific form of Christian nationalism that has grown up in the last 50 years. Uh, and it's, it's, they're, they're excellent books um, that lay this out. Uh, we've seen, you know, President, uh, Professor Vermeule, a very prominent uh, Harvard professor, said, wrote a piece uh, in The Atlantic in which he said, look, originalism was fine when we were trying to restrain liberal judges. That, that, it was great. It was a good way to talk about it. But we're in control now. We don't need to do that. And what we need is what he called common good constitutionalism. And that is constitutionalism that enforces the central role of the church. And that is on the agenda of at least some of these justices. And it is not going to go down well in a large part of our society. What happens is, I, 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 can't, I can't predict it, but I always remember uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She didn't have many immortal uh, words in her uh, opinion. She was very earnest and, and, and worked very hard and very eager to produce a solution that uh, compromised things that sometimes couldn't be compromised. But in a church and state case where the majority had begun to move in the direction I described, she wrote an opinion that ended, why would we replace a system that has worked so well for us with a system that has worked so badly for others. And we are on a collision course with that question. Might one of the ways to get a handle on some of this uh, be the confirmation of justice? As you commented that uh, the hearings on candidates recently have appeared to be more to make political points than to elicit information. Public hearings started with Brandeis. Yes. So they're not, doesn't go back to the original days. Is there um, a better way to uh, select a justice or to look at a justice before they are approved? Well, you know, that's a, that's a hard question, and I, I have actually thought a lot about it and come up with my usual uh, non-answer. Um, uh, I think that there is something very useful. Uh, you know, we live in a, we don't live in 1916, 1917 when Brandeis was came to the court. We live in the 21st century where the internet and television, you know, permit people to participate or at least observe what's going on. Uh, there is something very, very useful about having a nominee for the court sit down and present him or herself to the public. Uh, you know, uh, it, is, it is absolute gospel among the conservative legal movement that uh, Robert Bork was, was slimed and attacked and, and, and you know, uh, uh, slandered uh, in his hearings. But if you go back and look at them, what happened was he came in, you know, Biden said, sit down, Judge Bork, uh, we want to ask you some questions. And they said, what do you think of the Griswold case? And it was a very respectful, it was like, I mean, it was dull, That's but it was like, contraception. Yeah, 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 the contraception case. What he, but but uh, uh, Bork just answered the questions, and the people watching at home said, my God, we don't want this man on the court. Uh, and that's the way it should work, right? Now, increasingly, these things are staged. But I honestly say that if we have to have this court that we have now, which we do, right, I am profoundly glad that the American people saw Brett Kavanaugh as he really is. Justice Kavanaugh is very good at presenting himself as the kind of helpful junior woodchuck who's here to help you across the street, right? <laughs> we know there's another side to the man. And he is the first justice in history, I think, to introduce partisan politics by name into the testimony of a nominee and threaten you know, revenge on the Democratic Party. And I think it's important that people know that. On the other hand, we get to, you know, the Katanji Brown-Jackson uh, uh, hearings, 
And my guess is that there's no confirmation system that can be saved if one side just decides to lie. So the whole idea that she somehow was pro-pedophile. I mean, you can't, you can't refute that, right? Um, and if that's what the, um, these hearings are going to be like, God help us. Um, yeah. So well, and, and here's my non-answer. Yeah, you yeah. said that the hearings are staged. Yeah. There is a question beginning, the high school students want to know. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. Uh, which is, does the recording of audio and video in the court, mm -hmm. uh, which are readily available to the public, make the court proceedings, not just the confirmation hearings, more of a stage? And does that make justices feel they have to perform? Um, and you know, does, is the answer to that uh, something to minimize that, or does it make any difference? Well, there are several parts of that. The first thing I'll say is this question of, of performance by the justice. I always said that I thought that the court would uh, begin televising its proceedings the week after Justice Scalia's funeral because I don't know of a single person who wasn't terrified of what Scalia would do if he was given uh, a TV camera to play to. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that's, not a, that's, that's true across the board. I, I can tell you that I saw the Chief Justice absolutely lose his patience uh, with Justice Scalia you know, during the Obamacare case, when in the middle of, I mean, this is a damn serious case, right? Is there gonna be an Affordable Care Act or not? In the middle of it, Justice Scalia, for reasons best known only to himself, began doing old Jack Benny radio routines. You know, like, your money or your life, you know, and Jack Benny's like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And, and the Chief Justice said, you know, let's, let's leave that out of it. And he goes right ahead with these jokes. And finally, the Chief Justice says, that's enough frivolity for a while, right? <laughs> Chief Justices don't usually do that. Um, that didn't happen. But on the other hand, we now have this live broadcast of audio not long after Scalia passed off the court. So whether there's a connection with that. Has Justice Roberts yeah. lost control of the court? Well, you know, define control of the court. I think, I think Roberts, um, you know, some say yes and some say absolutely. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to premise my remarks by saying, you know, and this is something I never entirely thought I would say, but that I feel for John Roberts. Um, he is very conservative. He's as conservative as anybody on the court, with the possible exception of Justice Thomas. But he takes seriously the job he was given, which is care of the institution. And for that reason, he has tried very hard to keep the court in a lane that at least resembles law. And there are five justices on the court now who are much more attuned to the Thomas approach uh, we were talking backstage, uh, uh, Walt and I, about, about Justice Thomas. And I said, you know, the last thing I did before I came over here was reread Justice Thomas's uh, separate opinion in Dobbs, the abortion case. And this is the famous opinion where he says, basically, we need to get rid of the cases to protecting contraception, same-sex marriage, uh, interracial marriage, all of these. I mean, he, he doesn't hint. You know, the news reports say... Uh, that Justice Thomas hinted. He didn't hint it. He says, these are erroneous decisions. We should overturn them as soon as possible. He did mention loving? No, I he didn't. Know. He didn't mention <laughs> loving. That was a miss. Uh, I misspoke. But, uh, uh, but, you know, these are very serious. You know, Lawrence versus Texas, protection of, of uh, the right of adults to have uh, uh, intimate sexual conduct with other, uh, uh, contact with other adults. He wants them overturned. And, you know, where does this come from? So I went through that opinion with a, a pen, and I underlined every case that he cited, you know, as authority for this radical jurisprudence. And I came up with 25 citations. 14 of them are to opinions he wrote <laughs> for himself only in other cases where he dissented, right? So, that's not law. I mean, you know, it may be very worthy, perhaps. You know, I, I, I will admit it's possible 
that Clarence Thomas is smarter than James Madison, John Marshall, uh, Earl Warren, Bill Brennan. It's possible. I, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced. But even if it were true, that's not the way judges operate. They don't say, you know, I was thinking about this the other day and we ought to change it all. This whole thing sucks. Rip it out, right? That's just, that's just not the way it, it should be done. What should we be thinking about or looking towards in terms of next year's, next term? Well, we've got some, some pretty big ones uh, on, the, uh, on the agenda, and the two ones that I think people are mostly are going to pay most attention to um, are uh, the, the Harvard affirmative action case. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that this is, the agenda is to do away with affirmative action altogether. I think um, there, I don't feel a lot of suspense about the outcome of that case. Uh, and the other one is the so-called independent state legislature case, which uh, really permits or opens the door to a fairly serious possibility of rigging the next presidential election by state legislatures in uh, all red states. Uh, the idea being that the, the Constitution says each state shall select uh, in a manner chosen by the legislature thereof a certain number of electors. That's how we elect our president. The electoral college is an absolutely dreadful thing, but, but that's how we do it. And that has been done for 200 years by the legislature passing statutes and the state courts interpreting and enforcing those statutes. This is a state matter. The term legislature was con considered to be, um, you know, to mean the state's legal system. That's what legislature means, you know. Just like we say Congress has the power to do X, and what that means is Congress can pass laws, the courts can enforce them, the executive can carry them out, uh, the whole government is involved. Um, well, the theory has originated, and it is very new, if anybody wants to talk about originalism, this opinion dates all the way back to 2000. Um, that the word legislature in, in Article 2 means that the legislature alone and that state courts cannot interpret or change or block any of the, of the measures that the legislature puts in place for selection of electors. And state courts routinely do this. We have a number of states where the state courts have interpreted the right to vote as being much more robust than the federal courts have. So that in the state of Pennsylvania, for example, you know, there is a right to vote that is, that is much more protected uh, than it is in, in other states. If the independent legislature theory becomes the law, those decisions will have no effect at all. The legislature can do whatever it wants, ranging from you know, setting aside the election if it doesn't go the way it wants, and naming its own set of electors, to putting in very onerous restrictions or putting in gerrymandered districts for electing electors, and there will be no recourse. Um, except, of course, only one other body would be involved, and that's our friendly Supreme Court. They, uh, they would end up with, with more power. Um, that's a very disturbing possibility. I, I regard that case as not settled. It's not like the affirmative action case. Uh, if you look back at the cases, uh, the Chief Justice has written about this issue in a, in a case called Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission, in which he said at that time, look, the people can restrict the role of the legislature. They can't, what they can't do is take it away from them entirely. Uh, and no one is talking about that. Now, as I say, uh, the disturbing thing about this is this is a theory that is literally all of 20 years old. And if you go back, uh, I actually tried to do this um, uh, not long ago. Uh, where did this come from? Well, it first appears in the case law in a separate opinion uh, by Chief Justice Rehnquist in uh, that old American favorite, Bush versus Gore, uh, where he basically says, I think the legislature can do whatever it wants and that the Florida Supreme Court has no power to order uh, a recount, which, of course, eventually the, uh, 
the court held. Um, and I, I said, well, where does, where's he getting this? There is no literature. There is no history of cases holding this. Uh, and I, I found its origin in a brief filed by the Bush campaign in the Bush versus Core case, citing nothing except the text of the Constitution. Now, the one thing I'm going to say, and I think it's just suggestive, I'm not drawing the connection directly at present, but at the time that this was going on, the Florida legislature was actually considering a bill that would have set aside the election and designated Florida's electors as uh, Bush electors. If the recount had come out the other way, they were prepared to pass that. And I watched the hearing on that bill, you know, because it's, you think about that, so that's kind of out there, right? Well, who shows up to testify? Does the name John C. Eastman strike a familiar note? Okay, so we may be one vote away from adopting the John Eastman system of choosing presidents. And that's disturbing. I, I hope that, that, uh, some of the justices are open to persuasion on this. I have one last question, but what you've just answered shows the importance, and this may be something for another seminar, on the importance of the way in which state court judges are yes, selected. Yes, absolutely. Um, but a final question is, in, given uh, substantive differences, and even with them, uh, the court is thought of as a collegial body. Uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg not only went to the opera together, they had one written about them uh, together. Uh, given all of the fractured nature of the decision-making, can it continue as a collegial body? I, I think the collegial court is pretty much dead now. I, I don't think it's a question of can it continue. Uh, I think the events of this spring, the Dobbs leak, uh, and what we know about the background of the Dobbs leak indicate, you know, the traditional description uh, of the Supreme Court is nine scorpions in a bottle. And I think we're a lot closer to scorpion status than we were five years ago. The court, you know, I, I have never been an insider in the court. I, I never had the honor of clerking for a justice. I've known a lot of people who have. Uh, and it, it was, they took very seriously the idea that this was a family and that they, they, you know, they might disagree, but, but that they were all part of a, a, a special group. Uh, I think that the court today internally is much more like Congress than it was five years ago. Um, and that's one of the things about the Dobbs leak. You know, when the, when the opinion of the Dobbs leak was leaked on May 2nd, um, and immediately one group of people said, oh my God, they're overturning Roe versus Wade, which was my reaction. Another group of people said, oh my God, this is so dreadful, there's been a leak. <laughs> oh no, that's so bad, right? And uh, of course we now have the um, marshal of the court, whose chief duty hitherto was to go, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> conducting uh, an investigation and asking the clerks to furnish their cell phone data. I mean, that, that is a shocking thing for a justice's clerks to be asked. Um, but the kind of weeping over the, the, the leak struck me as, as somewhat crocodilian because the last major leak from the court was in the, summer, the, the spring of 2012 when conservative clerks, and clearly with the approval of some conservative justices or justices, leaked to the Wall Street Journal that the Chief Justice was considering changing his vote to uphold the Obamacare. And the idea was to put, uh, to put pressure on Roberts not to change his vote. So, you know, we come forward. There was a similar leak a month before Dobbs about the Chief Justice and can we rely on him uh, and so forth. And I think the fact of the matter is that when you have a political body, when you have the White House, let's say, or when you have the Congress, a political body with partisan divisions, you know, zero-sum struggles over, over political outcomes, leaks are just part of life. You just have to deal with it. Live, live by the leak and die by the leak. And I think the court is there now. I don't think we'll ever go back, or ever is a long term, but it will be quite a while.
The scorpions have gotten out of the bottle. Yeah, well, I think that that is what is happening. Watch the tail. We thank you very much, Garrett, for being here for helping us understand a little better what we have to look forward to.